Hi everyone, I'm Dathri. I uh, lead public engagement at the Archives at MCBS, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to the TSC Shastri paper launch. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, uh, Archives at MCBS is a public collecting center for the history of science in contemporary India. Uh, we opened doors in February 2019 and uh, has since housed over 24 collections that document the life and work of scientists, researchers, and administrators who have had considerable contribution to the discipline. Um, these collections consist of uh, primary sources such as letters, photographs, um, drafts, lab notes, uh, field notes, um, and these are available on a catalog on our website, which is www.archives.ncbs.rest.in. Um, the TSC Shastri collection was uh, donated to us in the late 2019 by members of the Shastri family. Uh, and although due to COVID restrictions, the process was delayed, uh, I'm happy to announce that the collection is finally public. Um, we'll be celebrating the collection going live by having an overview of the same and sharing the platform with researchers, archivists, and scientists who can provide context to TSC Shastri's work and consequently um, the development and the development of space science during the 60s and 70s. Uh, before we proceed, uh, I'd like to welcome our guests for the event. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar Rai, who will be um, providing perspective on India's space science history. Um, also, I would like to give a warm welcome to uh, members of the Shastri family and Balaji Patasati, uh, who have joined us both in person and online. Um, without whose involvement and interest, uh, this collection wouldn't exist. Um, to start off, I would like to invite uh, Brinda Shastri to the share, uh, to the stage to share her thoughts on the collection. Thank you, Zatri. Um, good evening, one and all. Uh, we, the family of uh, family members of T.S. Gopal Krishna Shastri, are pleased to be here today uh, for the inauguration of his papers. Um, which the team at NCBS Archives have thoroughly and thoughtfully curated. A deeply uh, religious man, uh, my father often chanted mantras from the Rig Veda to express his beliefs in life and his work. He was a meticulous person with a curious um, and inquiring mind, constantly seeking to unravel the unknown. <laughs> When we were clearing my father's belongings at our parents' home after his passing in 2017, we were overwhelmed by what he had collected over time, especially references to his past as a researcher and scientist at the PRL in Ahmedabad. We found several letters and photos chronicling his visits abroad and to Thumba, the first rocket launching site, and his interactions with various scientists over the world. These were precious to him as he kept reliving his past by going through these letters and photos over and over again. In particular, he reminisced about his association with his mentor, Vikram Sarabhai. We were at a loss as to how we might keep his material. And it was at the suggestion of Balaji Parthasati that we approached uh, Venkat Srinivasan to archive the materials at NCBS. 
We were grateful to Venkat for showing interest in the material and initiating the tedious task of collating it for the archives. Among the team members at NCBS, we thank Sanjana, who meticulously went through every item and categorized them into subject areas. And I think you will see some of um, examples of it uh, later. And to Ravi for assisting in organizing the digital material. We also thank other members of the uh, archives team, Anjali, Thatri, Prashant, and Ojas for assisting with the archival process. This particular event marks the centenary year of my father, and we are proud to be able to have you here today to join us for the event. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Venkat. I'm part of the team at the archives at NCBS, and I'd like to welcome all of you here, and thanks so much for being here. Um, Dhatri had mentioned this right in the beginning, so I just want to give a couple of quick overview points about who we are and what we do in case it's not familiar to some of you. Um, we are a public collecting archive. Um, sorry. We're a public collecting archive for the history of science in contemporary India. Um, and actually, this space is very critical, especially in, when we think about uh, the THG Sastri papers, uh, which I'll just mention in a moment. So just a quick uh, preface of sorts. Um, and I, we, we shared this in a previous launch of the collection. Um, the launch of the collection is what we'd like to think of in the beginning of a collection. Uh, we're really hoping that um, members of the public, members in this audience um, will continue sort of looking at a collection, see what is possible, and then share something with us in the years and decades ahead, even if it is a single photograph or a single letter, just in the same way that the Patri family has been so kind and generous in sharing what they thought was valuable to future generations. Uh, do reach out to us at archives at NCBS if you'd like to understand a little bit more of this. Um, I don't need to sort of just put this disclaimer out to say that, you know, archives will always be in a perpetual state of incompleteness. They're not meant to be exhausted, but we can we can tend towards that if we constantly look for a diversity of sources from different parts of the world. Um, in terms of what we do at the archive, there are four broad verticals in which we operate. Um, of course, for, you know, the most obvious one is, of course, the fact that we collect and preserve for the future. Um, we do research, as was evident through a guidebook that we released uh, last month around ethics and law in India. Um, we uh, try and work with uh, students in different age groups uh, around uh, what we think is building an archival sensibility of sorts. We basically brainwash them around our game. Um, and um, we, we do quite a bit of public engagement uh, just to sort of build a certain broader awareness um, around what the possibilities of an archive are. Um, most people are not necessarily aware of what an archive is, and this has been a good opportunity for us. And of course, Dhatri is leading those efforts uh, right now. I do want to acknowledge, uh, you know, the, the members of the Sastri family and Balaji in particular, to you know, for you know, even thinking of us in the first place. It's not, it's not common for you know families and individuals to say this should go into an archive. And I just want to sort of thank you again because this this means a lot to us, um, and hopefully you'll. Um, you'll see value in this in the years and decades um, going forward. Um, I also want to sort of give you a shout out, of course, to NCBS for supporting us and to ATNQ, which has supported the work of all the people who are at the archives right now and who made this work possible over the last two years or so. And those people are um, mentioned here. So um, we forget how extraordinary, I mean, this collection is sometimes. It's, it's, it's about 10,000, it's more than 10,000 objects. I mean, when I say objects, I mean letters and research papers. And we only found this out, I think, last week when we just, you know, finally sort of documented how many objects we have individually in the collection. Because till that time, we didn't really know how many individual objects there are. Um, and it was it was a revelation to me as well. Um, this is not to say that we have, so each object is not fully described, but each folder or each sort of coherent section has been described in detail. And as uh, Brinda mentioned, we're delighted that we're able to do this at the centenary year of THG Sastri. I mentioned that we are a public center for the history of science. Without the Sastri papers, that would not have happened. Uh, this is the first non-biology collection at the archives at NCBS. And since then, we've received a few other collections which go beyond biology and sort of really cement us as maybe a public collecting center for the history of science in contemporary India. There are many, many people who've been involved with this. I should, you know, just, you know, just go right to the beginning. There was Gayatri, who's there at the mask, which is reflective of the time when she was an intern, um, late 2020, early 21, when we just received the papers, uh, sorry, late 2019, early 2020, and then she worked on it in the late 2020 sort of phase. Um, 
just when we were trying to figure out what we can do with this collection, I don't know if biology remembers, we were still not sure whether this would be the right place to keep it, but we just decided to catalog it at that time. We were not quite a center for the history of science at that moment. But really, this, this collection has, has been made possible by the, the meticulous work that Sanjana has done over a couple of years, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure exactly how long she spent on this. She would probably know this, and she's, of course, on the call on Zoom. Um, it's unfortunate that she can't join us in person. She's in Geneva right now. But this collection really, you know, she's breathed so much of her way of thinking into this collection that I'm just, you know, as an individual archivist, I'm just very grateful for the way she's brought this collection, has made it and really made it her own over this period of work that she's done. And of course, some of you are also familiar with um, the creative aspects that she's shown through the collection, uh, which was something that she had um, launched in August of 2022, which I think Brinda, you were also there at the time. Um, nothing in the archive can happen without Ravi's presence. So, you know, to give a shout out to Ravi for just making this possible. And of course, to Anjali and Prashant for having meticulously sort of done the proofreading to make sure that we catch the mistakes. We don't sort of, you know, ensure that you know, this collection is true to the best of our knowledge. There will still be mistakes. I, don't, I can't deny it. But if there are, please let us know so we can fix them. Uh, to Dhati for really picking out the things that, you know, we can pull out and make visible to the broader world. To Ojas for making this available on the web. Uh, which is this, so you can use your phones to have a look at the catalog online right now. Um, it's 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 an extraordinary amount of work. So I, what I'm trying to get at is really that, you know, archival collections are driven by many individual people who sort of bring it together. And their job really is to make sense of what is there. We may not always fully understand what is there, but to the largest extent possible, our effort is to try and make sense, connect the dots. And through each of the various individuals, you know, through, Dan, through Sanjana, through Anjali through Prashant that I've learned a little bit through, you know, learning from how they see the collections and in particular how some have seen the collection over the last couple of years. So thanks to all of you for making this possible. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Anjali now to give a broader overview, maybe some snippets um, from this collection, just to give you a flavor of what this collection has. Anjali. Um, hi, today I'm just going to take you through uh, some of the objects within the collection and the records so that you will get a better idea of um, who this person was and why they're here uh, looking through their papers. So the records uh, help you understand uh, T.S.G. Shastri, who was a physicist, and you also get to know all these institutions that he worked with, like PR al Ahmedabad, like International Committee for Space Research, known as INCOSPA, like the University of California, Berkeley, and University of New Hampshire, where he worked. We also get to know about his early research um, and work, which involved uh, the construction of radio equipment used in cosmic ray research. We also get to know about his collaboration with the NASA Goddard Center, where he worked on magnetometer payloads used to study space weather. And this is something he continued to research on and work on at Tumba in the 1960s, uh, where he worked on magnetometers carried on sounding rockets used to study a space weather phenomenon known as the equatorial electrojet. Mm. The collection itself um, contains uh, 460 records um, or about 10,696 digital files. Um, they have basically been arranged into correspondence, papers, research papers and administration, research data and artifacts, research reference and personal items like photographs, memorabilia, greeting cards, postcards, etc. The collection can be accessed on our website, archives.ncbs.res.in, and you can go through our access page to understand how you can use and access the material. You can also come and visit us on weekdays between 10 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. at the archives. Mm, yeah, when I was going through the papers, I got an introduction to early space history. Um, I got to know about um, how which institutions worked in space research in India before what every one of us know as ISRO. So I got to know about places like Inkospa, Turles at Tumba, and PR al Ahmedabad. And I realized that these papers are a wonderful resource to understand early Indian space history. Turles um, at Tumba features heavily in the Shastri papers. You can see uh, Tumba was a little known fishing village uh, in Trivandrum, Kerala, and it was picked as an ideal place to study the upper atmosphere due to its proximity to the magnetic equator. So the first lock, rocket was launched out of Tumba on 21st November 1963, and this essentially kick-started the Indian space program. Shastri joined Tumba, um, Turles at Tumba in 1964, and he worked on sounding rockets meant to collect data about the equatorial electrojet. Um, 
Um, there are several people that feature heavily in the Shastri papers. One such person is Vikram Sarabhai. Vikram Sarabhai was instrumental in Shastri's life in several ways. He mentored Shastri at PRL Ahmedabad. They continued to work together at Tumba. In this letter, you see Shastri reporting to Sarabhai about um, their um, work at Tumba. And then he also mentions um, that father, Shastri mentions that he would like to work at Nasa Godar. And uh, Sarabhai recommends Shastri and Shastri moves on to um, Nasa Godar to work on um, magnetometers. There's a lot of scientific data in this paper. Um, they, they are papers, um, the scientific data are in forms of graphs and prints. Uh, the graph on the left shows data from the rocket launch Shastri mentions to Sarabhai in the previous slide. It shows electric field meshing during the rocket ascent and descent. There are also lots of documentation of Shastri's travels across the world in form of photographs, letters, etc. He was part of a network of space scientists from across the world. He had worked for a period of time in the US and he had traveled to uh, various symposia and conferences from Paris to Tokyo. And what this essentially shows to you is um, an, a history of space uh, from um, not a very mainstream idea that we have of space being something that space history in the 60s being the space war between the US and the USSR. But through the Shakti papers, you realize that there's a lot of history in Czechoslovakia, in Japan, in Sri Lanka, in Peru, where along the equator, these space programs have started. And um, Prashant, uh, who's here, will uh, working on the Shakti papers, will tell you more about the scientific context and motivation for Shakti's work, as well as the value of the paper in the history of science. Thank you, Anjali. So uh, as Anjali mentioned, I'm a historian of science, and I'm just going to try and provide some context for Shastri's work. So Shastri began his scientific career during the early phase of space exploration, before human space flight, and only a couple of decades after the first rocket reached space. This collection therefore gives us a sense of how the stage was set for the space race of the late 60s. This story, as Anjali just mentioned, is usually about the rivalry between two superpowers, the US and the USSR. The truth is, of course, more complicated. I want to begin with these two questions. What were Shastri and his colleagues trying to understand? And why were the rockets launched at Tumba, of all places? The answers to both of these questions are related. One of the goals of the launches at Tumba was to understand a class of phenomena known as space weather. Just as an airline pilot must know something about the weather in order to fly safely, space flight requires an understanding of space weather. But obviously, it doesn't rain in space. So in, it, instead, the sun is constantly bombarding the Earth with charged particles, ions, which are deflected by the Earth's magnetic field. These particles form a powerful electrical current around the equator, which is known as the equatorial electrojet conducted by a layer of the upper atmosphere known as the ionosphere. So Tumba is very close to the magnetic equator, as Anjali mentioned, which made it an ideal site for studies about how the Earth's magnetic field influences this weather in space. So as you can see here on the map on the right, uh, the magnetic equator is actually at an angle to the geographical equator, and it's constantly shifting south. So the upper line shows where the magnetic equator is in 1955, and then by, the, by 1964, it's moved slightly south. The intensity of magnetic and electric fields in the ionosphere vary according to the sun's activity. Particularly intense events are known as magnetic storms and can affect the sensitive electronic equipment carried by spacecraft. To do this, a team of scientists and engineers at PRL Ahmedabad designed and built very sensitive devices to measure electric and magnetic fields, strapped them to rockets, and launched them. This required careful testing and precise calibration. On the left here, we can see a research engineer, P.V. Dharmarao, who is actually with us in the audience tonight, testing a device used to measure magnetic fields, known as a rubidium vapor magnetometer. These rockets sent data back down to receiving equipment at Tumba. This graph here in the center shows electric field measurements taken with a device known as a Langmuir probe. Together, electric and magnetic field measurements allowed scientists to create mathematical models of the equatorial electroject and so to predict the weather in space. 
So what Sastry's papers give us is a window into all of the science that had to happen in order to make spaceflight, and especially human spaceflight, a regular occurrence. From the late 50s, scientists at Tumba had been part of an international effort to understand magnetic storms. Indian scientists were part of a space weather monitoring network with sites across the Earth's equator, with sites in Huancayo in Peru, Alibaba in Maharashtra, San Juan in Puerto Rico, and Honolulu in Hawaii. The graph here on the left shows a magnetic storm measured on, uh, in 1958. But in order to launch spacecraft, you need to understand the effect of these magnetic storms hundreds of kilometers above the Earth's surface. So this was a truly global affair involving scientists from all across the world, and not just those in Western countries. Understanding the harsh environment of space was not only the work of the Russians and the Americans, but took the participation of scientists all across the world, working together towards a common goal. So that's it from, here, uh, from us here at the archives team. But next, I would like to introduce Professor Chandrasekhar who is the Tata Visiting Chair at NIAS. He was previously at ISRO, where his work dealt with satellite and rocket technology. He was also involved with activities related to international space science and has led Indian delegations to the United Nations Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Professor Chandrasekhar will now offer some reflections about space science in India during the 1970s. First of all, uh, it's an honor and privilege to be here. And I would like to thank Balaji and Venkat for, the, for all the arrangements that they have made to make sure that I do come here and share with you uh, some of the thoughts. The first thing I would like to claim is that I didn't know uh, Vikram Sarabhai directly, although I've heard him many times before uh, I joined this show. And of course, I have heard of Professor Shastri, but I had no direct personal contact with him. But having said that, I was uh, very much a part of a, of a major program within this zone for a fairly long period. And in the process, whether you like it or not, or whether you want to know it or not, you do assimilate a lot of the, of the things that, are, that go on within a very complex system that ISRO was at that time. And uh, therefore, it is indeed a great uh, honor and privilege for me to be here and to share with uh, Dr. Professor Shastri's uh, family and uh, you know, NCBS, uh, some of the possibilities, I think for a place like NCBS and the archives at NCBS to actually do a lot of uh, work that I think needs to be done on the science and technology scene in India, which is a very arid and it's practically like the Sahara Desert. So it's a pretty bad place in which we can actually go back and look at a little bit of the history of science and technology in our country. Uh, <clears throat> um, so what I would like to start off with is uh, to really look at uh, what I would call these two great uh, architects of modern India. One of course uh, was the father of the nuclear program uh, Homi Baba, and the other, of course, was Vikram Sarabhai, uh, who is the uh, father of the space program or the visionary who is responsible for the space program. And obviously, they were very, very closely connected in, uh, uh, in the social world as well as in the scientific world. And the reason for this connection is obviously a common interest that they shared in the origin and understanding of cosmic rays. These are rays that come from space. And because those rays are affected by some of the things that you saw, the, Earth's mag the Earth and the magnetic field of the Earth directly uh, link up with these, uh, with these cosmic rays and create all kinds of disturbances. So it, it's a major scientific problem. It's a complex scientific problem involving very interactive components from several sources. And actually trying to make sense of them is a, is a major issue in science. Now, they shared many common, uh, many common things. Sarabhai and uh, Baba were both privileged. They were uh, very rich. They were privileged. They had a very eclectic and broad-based, I would argue, liberal education. And uh, uh, they both shared uh, suddenly, I think, even in spite of the fact that they were, had many opportunities to do many other things in life, 
they suddenly became interested in the pursuit of this uh, great field of knowledge called physics. And they decided that they would therefore focus their attention on, on, on that, okay. And uh, in the process, not only did they feel that they had to do something in the domain itself, but I also think that they, were, they shared a common belief that they should transform India and they should transform the scientific uh, thinking within India. And therefore both of them set up these two great institutions, uh, which I think in a sense, you know, the Shastri papers kind of reintegrates these two great institu institutions that they created. One of course was Baba's creation of the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, which actually created NCBS in a sense, and therefore there is a heritage. And the other of course was the P uh, physical research laboratory which Sarabhai set up in order to pursue his own interests, basically related to uh, you know, uh, the cosmic ray phenomenon and what he had discovered uh, in terms of what I call the related atmospheric ionospheric connections and the activities of the sun, which, which people are talking about here. So they created these both, uh, they created these great institutions. Uh, Sarabhai set up TIFR in 1940, I mean, uh, Baba set up TIFR in 1945, Sarabhai created PRL in 1947. Almost, almost at the same time, and somewhere down the line, I mean, nobody knows exactly what uh, what motivated them. They decided to change and shift uh, focus a little bit, and they moved away, in a sense, from the field of science alone, which they pursued and continue to pursue till the end of their life because they're fundamentally researchers. But they also decided that the applications of these uh, major domains of knowledge had great uh, potential and uh, need in the development of India at that time. And therefore they both decided in, in and because of their very well-known and powerful connections, and they were both able to do that at that time, they created, in my opinion, specific organizations for the pursuit of nuclear, the nuclear area, the nuclear power part of the program, which was supposedly to transform India's development. And Sarabha himself created what is called the Indian National Committee for Space Research because the potential of satellites happened in 1957 when Sputnik was actually launched by the Soviet Union. Uh, of course, Hiroshima preceded and therefore TIFR came up a little bit before uh, INCOSPA and DAE came up a little bit before uh, the Indian Space Research Organization. But in a sense, you can argue that it was this global developments and the, and the creation of Hiroshima uh, you know, the, uh, what I called the Cold War or the early days of the Cold War and the potential of nuclear power changed Baba's belief in what he had to do. In the same sense, the launch of Sputnik and the immense possibilities that it threw up both for development as well as for the military part might have motivated Sarabhai. The, the area of actually what led them to do this is still open and I'll talk a little bit about it as, as I go on. So, so this was the, this is the kind of standard narrative that you do, and let me push the Sarabha story a little bit beyond that, at least the versions that we all read and learned about in this book. And one of them was that he suddenly woke up and he discovered the great potential of satellites and rockets, and then he set up turrets, okay? And it was this great uh, ability that he had to influence Americans that helped him get all the support that was needed in order to set up turrets. And uh, then from turrets, he decided that uh, we would create the basis for uh, uh, the rocket part of the program and therefore the production of sounding rockets. And then from the production of sounding rockets to be able to develop a launch vehicle, the SLV-3 project, he saw the vision of potential of uh, mass communications and therefore site, right? And then from site to INSAT and then from SLV-3 to GSLV-3, you could kind of leapfrog, right? And then transform the development of the country. I mean, this was the vision that he had at that time. And these, in a sense, followed one after the other in a kind of logical sequence. And the other part of the, of the story about Sarabha was that if all this had happened and he had continued to live beyond that, yeah, India would have become a much more advanced country, maybe even more. Right? And a lot of it is also a, what I call a deification or a glorification of the leaders that we have. Both Baba and Sarabha are icons. I definitely think they need to be icons. But one must not forget that around them, they also had this extremely talented caliber of a lot of other people who actually made differing contributions and maybe actually created a lot of the conditions that enabled all these things to happen. 
Therefore, in a sense, one would argue this is not a straightforward problem of only leadership, but the creation of an entire, to use a word from the biological sciences, creation of an Indian ecosystem to further its development. That is the kind of thing that we have to talk about. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make really is that the, this is the standard narrative. And in my opinion, it's a pretty boring narrative. We have heard it many times in this book. We can do all this part. What does this narrative actually lack? I would argue that the narrative forgets. Right? There is in this narrative, there is no mention of people. There is no mention of organizations. There is no mention of the normal relations between people, hierarchies, power politics. There is no mention of the global forces that might have shaped and altered uh, what, what we did and how we did it. How were many of these decisions made? Who made them? What were the forces that shaped these decisions? In other words, there's a complete lack of what went on inside both the atomic energy program of that time and definitely I can speak with fair amount of confidence on the parts that have to do with the space program. So how is it? So in a sense, you could argue that most of these entities that made up the ecosystem were treated as black boxes. You know? So ultimately these black boxes behave very rationally. You give it an input, it behaves very rationally and throws out an output. And that alone is enough in order to explain the successes or in some sometimes the failures of our system. I mean, this is the way we tend to look at. Uh, I would argue that this narrative, while it is true in some parts of it, is not completely true. And why is it not completely true? Because it completely ignores a lot of the social aspects of the ways in which organizations and peoples interacted with each other in order to make the achievement of a common goal or a common project possible. And I think this is one of the major problems in the understanding of our history, uh, as well as our understanding of the history of science or technology in our country. I think the Shastri papers will make a major contribution because for the first time, it focuses on the people to people issues, on all the, all the internal workings of a complex system and how the various elements of it worked together or worked against at times in order to achieve what it did. Okay. So let me illustrate this with a couple of uh, examples. <clears throat> now, I will take the example of turtles and the story around turtles to make the point. And why our understanding of a lot of these issues that happened at that time is still, I would argue, incomplete. Uh, Everybody knows, anybody who's familiar with the world at, at that time knew, for example, that the Americans were not interested in India ever getting to do any work related to missiles. And why did they have this reservation? And again, it goes back to the Baba Sarabhai connection and the fact that nuclear weapons and ICBMs were kind of evolved in the global scene together. The US was always worried that India would go nuclear and then it would develop a missile in order to be able to put that missile. So the, what I would argue again is there is an inextricably close connection between the atomic energy program or the nuclear program and the space program, and it's largely military, and the US is always concerned about this proliferation risk. Uh, so why did they give uh, sounding rocket technology? Because you know, sounding rockets are the building blocks of, of rocket, right? but the US gave it. Now the standard narrative again is that Sarabhai and his ability to influence the powerful people in the US is solely responsible for that. I'm not so sure. There were, I'm sure there were other forces that shaped some of these uh, events. And therefore, one needs to get a better handle on what exactly happened. And the other part of the story is the US directly did not support the launch vehicle program of India. But it did not during the Dawan period. For example, we developed the PSLV. And we got the technology for the, for the second stage of PSLV from the French. Now, the Americans didn't do anything to stop that exchange, even though they might have, could have done it. They didn't do anything to stop that exchange. But if you go back a little further down, right, and we look at what happened in the cryogenic engine of ISRO, for example, you can see very clearly that by that time, the US had been at position had changed from benign tolerance 
right? Turls was set up in a sense because it was benign, right? Because the engine and the PSLV was again during the Darwin period made possible because of what I think was much more open kind of system. And when we had come to the cryo stage, right, things had changed completely. And instead of being what I would call, uh, the Americans were positively uh, proactive in making sure that the deal did not go through. So from what I would call more like a defensive oriented approach, it took a much more proactive approach in order to make sure that India's position in the launch vehicle domain became significantly reduced, okay? So I would like to understand, for example, through this narrative, what were the elements that made all these changes happen? So we are actually looking at something like an evolutionary history of one of the major areas of concern to India, right? And how did it actually evolve over these kinds of periods? Okay. So that is one of the things that I, 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 I think is, so these studies are therefore crucial for understanding these very complex relationships that create what I would call uh, a narrative of sorts. Okay. And they give us an understanding of how we should look at the past, maybe learn from the past and move forward. Okay, so obviously papers like the Shastri papers and uh, many more such papers, if and when they become accessible, would contribute a great deal to what I would call understanding the social dimensions, which is very often missing in most historical narratives. I would argue the social, political, and economic dimensions are as important as the technical dimensions in looking at these complex ecosystems. Okay, so that's the first main point that I want to make. So the study of the history of science and technology in India, right, can do with archives, and it can do with archives, especially papers and other kinds of photographs that enable us to fix these relationships in their proper context and provide us with a more nuanced understanding than these very simplistic narratives that we often hear. So this is, a, this is, I think, one message that we must take. The other part I think about the role of all this uh, is about, I think many of these studies can also contribute in a fundamental way to understanding what I would call as innovation, innovation within organizations. I was fortunate enough to be involved in one of ISRO's major programs from the start of the program till it became a very viable and a state of art program. And this is the Indian remote sensing program, right? Now, when we started, we launched this satellite called Bhaskara, which was a one kilometer resolution satellite. I think it was sent up in 1981 with Russian help or Soviet help. And uh, I remember making a presentation in NASA and presenting something and they actually asked me, right, uh, you know, whether this is one kilometer, whether I had the right number, I had 2000 meters, they said whether I had the right number. And, and over a period of about 15 years, uh, I think by 1997, uh, we had launched an IRS, uh, one of the IRS satellites, I think it was the IRS 1C, where we had become the satellite with the highest civilian resolution in the world. And for, for in that period of 15 years, we transformed from a very backward uh, position in the, in the global competitive landscape into the lead provider of the highest resolution civilian satellite in the world. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to have lived through that and uh, I would argue, for example, how it was achieved, what made it happen. Largely, I think it was as much a technical part as a social and power uh, related understanding of organizational processes and organizational systems. I can look at other areas where I was also exposed. We moved, for example, uh, from a relatively primitive uh, choice of propellant in the SLV3 and we had, I think, the world's most advanced propellant when we did PSLV. Right? So once again, we jumped technology cycles and we were able to reach state of the art. Well, Vikram Sarabhai always talked about leapfrog. And he had this famous analogy about, uh, for example, I remember listening to a talk by him at the convocation in IIT Madras when I was a student. 
and he talked about the power of three to the power of 18. And of course, he made the point that in the last two steps, almost all of that will be covered, almost entirely the number will be covered. And therefore, this leapfrogging idea was largely a Vikram Sarabhai. My boss, Professor Dhawan, was much more analytical. And I remember spending a lot of time trying to map all these different things, put some numbers on them, and try to figure out where we were and what we could do and what we could do with that. So I remember using a lot of these S curves, right? I don't know, don't call Walter type curves, you know, S curves and all that, in order to look at all these limits and how technologies are changing and evolving and whether we could actually make these transitions. It was much more quantitative. And in the process, I think we were actually able to do many more things. So I mentioned the IRS. IRS was a visible example of what we did and how we got to a very state-of-the-art kind of problem. We made a number of other transitions. Propellants was one. We did a lot of work on gyros. And we moved from an earlier generation where we put a lot of money. We decided it was not the right way to go. And we moved to the later generation or the next generation. And once again, we made this kind of jump. So Professor Dawan therefore lent a lot of substance and actual ability to do, uh, which in a sense Vikram Sarabhai may not have had the opportunity or the time to do. And that was one of the great things that we did in this job. So there's a lot of stuff. I'm sure that within PRL, I'm sure that within the uh, TIFR and the other establishments we are looking at, many of these challenges would have been similar. Right? And they were really related to the fact that we did not have the resources or there were some embargoes for ISRO, for example, because of US embargoes. Many of them forced us. So in a sense, you can argue that necessity sometimes forces invention and sometimes innovation. And sometimes innovation also comes because there are possibilities that you can do that, and therefore you create needs. So it works both ways. And I think some of those ways and understanding those ways and the social processes associated with that, those ways is very important. So I would again make the point that innovation studies, especially with related to specific technologies and how they were created, is another area where we could actually look at using archives and people who are still around in order to substantiate and kind of give substance to that. So this is another area where I think active research of sorts is, would be very useful. And the last thing I would like to make before I kind of end up is I, you know, I was fortunate in this role to look at a lot of people who came from several different organizations. We were clearly having four different streams of people when I was a part of this role. Uh, one was obviously the founder uh, people, that is PRL, uh, Vikram Sarabhai, and a lot of Vikram Sarabhai's uh, 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 people populated this role, right? Uh, Professor Rao was from there. Uh, Kasturi Rangan, who became a chairman, Professor Rao also became a chairman uh, from PRL. I have a number of other colleagues who came from PRL. When Professor Dhawan took over, there was a lot of exchange between TIFR and PRL. Right? I think Professor Yashpal came in from TIFR to head the Space Application Center. Devinder Lal came from TIFR again to head PRL. Right? And there were a lot of these changes. Many of my colleagues, George, who looked at the uh, satellite cameras, Kamath who looked at all the image, they were all from TIFR. So we had this other stream because of the Dhawan takeover, the TIFR part and the PRL part kind of my making the Dhawan, I mean the Sarabhai Baba connection. And that was the other thing that was there at the time. And then we had this third crowd, which was actually recruited directly by Vikram Sarabhai, who populated largely Trivandrum. Right? Kalam uh, is uh, one of them. But many of them came from abroad. Dr. Gawarikar, who became a, a DST secretary, Dr. Muthunayan, who became the Earth Sciences, Dr. Gupta, who did a lot of work on gyros. Uh, and we had a whole string of people who came from, from that. And the fourth element was, of course, the Bark School, and a lot of people who came from Bark, Alwamudan, and a whole lot of other people came from Bark and did a lot of the work in this sort of group, and a lot of. So what I uh, feel another area is these organizations were created, TIFR was created in 45, 47. They came with a stock of people, right? Through their PhD program, they actually generated a lot of other people, right? These people were very well connected with the international world. The people who came out of those institutions found places either inside or outside India. 
understanding what happened and how they moved and what were their contributions in terms of the overall uh, contribution to the world of knowledge or to the world of uh, to the world and in a general way is another thing that I think we can we can we can do a lot of. Right? And I think without archives and without some focus for looking at some of these problems, I think we need uh, we need therefore a lot of effort to go into this. And I think it's a very important part to understand a little bit of what what had happened in the past and through that understanding whether we could actually do things a little bit better in the future. I think it's a very important thing especially for these complex undertakings, which are currently uh, what I call the world is moving towards increased complexity as we evolve. And before I kind of wind up, I'd just like to make one other point. Uh, I think it is a great thing that this uh, archives and the desire to do research based on these archives is anchored at a place like the National Center for Biological Sciences. And why do I say it? I think the greatest contribution to the world of our time has come from this, this chain of Darwinian thinking, right? Mendelian genetics, right? And understanding the power and the reproducibility of the DNA, right? I think these three great uh, innovations uh, has changed the world, has changed the way we can look and understand the world. Uh, I think Darwin and his contribution is maybe much more fundamental. You know, I come from the domain of engineering and physics. So we always thought of Newton and Einstein as the gods, but I have revised my opinion based upon what little I know of this. And I believe that it is Darwin who would possibly rank the highest among all these great uh, scientists of the world. And why am I saying that? Now, I used to teach a course on technology. Now, if you look at DNA as a fundamental problem, right? DNA is, or genes in a more general way, it is encoded information, right? And if you look at technologies, again, you know, in a more general way, technologies are also encoded information, right? And what is the great thing about genes? You can kind of, they play around, you can exchange all kinds of things. So there's, they innately create variation, right? And technologies too, innately, right, can create variations. And again, you know, markets choose technologies, some technologies win, some technologies do. The outside world uh, selects genes, some genes flourish, some don't, right? So there's a selection process. And the ones that are selected are obviously the ones that are likely to grow, right? And they in turn will stimulate other growth. And so the cycle keeps going on and on. So one would argue that understanding technology, which is obviously a part of science and science and technology go hand in hand and understanding that and making, uh, you know, looking at what's going to happen is, is a very, is, is a Darwinian process. And therefore this ability to apply this is kind of important. I don't know whether any of you have read this fantastic book by Richard Dawkins called The Selfish Gene, right? I read it, I mean, I'm not a biologist. I, I don't know very little about most of what I'm talking about, although I talk about it. Right? But he had this fantastic notion of what he called the cultural equivalent of a gene. And he gave it a term called main, right? A lot of culture, beliefs, values, all is also encoded information. And it has the same characteristics as, as the heredity process that is talked about in the Darwinian, um, in the Darwinian approach. And therefore, we can look at a, uh, an extension of the Darwinian approach, not only vertically through generations, but across our space, our, our laterally. Right? And we can look at culture as also something that follows something very much akin to a Darwinian process. And therefore, I would come back and argue that the evolutionary approach to looking at the world right, uh, brings in this dynamic uh, dynamism. And I think that dynamism is very important. And obviously, the world itself is uh, moving towards evolutionary approaches. So, I mean, one is familiar with the biological world. You know, you have evolutionary psychology. Uh, I don't know, you have evolutionary biology, obviously, right? You have sociobiology, again, another. Right. 
uh, comparative anthropology may be a variant, not necessarily in terms of evolutionary approaches. You have all these things which are a part of mainstream, but, but I think the biological world is actually corrupting, you would argue, in a sense, the other parts of the social world, definitely. I know there are evolutionary uh, economics, for example, we teach it in business school, where well, we teach. And there is this famous uh, thing that I used to use a lot, evolutionary game theory, right? Which is again, another evolving field. And a lot of it can be applied to geopolitics. It's obviously applied in the biological world, right? And it's applied in many other fields, including the business world, right? The word ecosystem, the word meme, right? And we have this word in the business world called co-optation, which actually means cooperation and competition at the same time, which is actually derived directly from the biological world. And many of the product uh, evolution curves and uh, industry evolution curves and technology evolution curves that we talk about in the strategy uh, class I used to teach are derived directly from biological approaches. I think there's an equation called the lotka volter equation, which looks at cooperation and competition. And those are some of the things that are now finding the way into the business world. So I think therefore that the way of looking at the world that NCBS provides and the fact that they have the archives and the fact that they have all these research capabilities available in, in this great institution uh, would make a great case for trying to put at least some of the effort, anchoring some of the effort maybe by itself, maybe in collaboration with others to look at how we can apply this knowledge base that we have to understanding right, the past, especially the scientific aspect of our past. I'd like to stop here and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so for the wonderful reflection on uh... The history of space science in India and how it was came to be. So now we have oh, Otis. Um, Anjali, just, Anjali. Oh, oh. Uh, now we have Anjali giving us a brief overview of our uh, digital catalog. Yeah, so um, the entire collection, um, the catalog is online. You can visit us on our website um, catalog and then yeah, you can search for the Shastri collection. The entire catalog is here. Um, you can basically on the right side you see that we have all the series and the sub series. You can go through that, uh, like for oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so the collection's online. It's on our website. You can basically go to the website, access the papers. The catalog is available on the right, so you can click on. Uh, for example, if you're interested in correspondence, you have all the major sub series there. So if you're looking at foreign scientists, you click on foreign scientists and. Um, yeah, you can click on ask anybody there if you are interested in that. And then you have uh, you have the title and the letters in which period of time it's from and things like that. And then essentially, what you need to look for is the identifier. If you send us a list of the identifier material that you're interested in, we can share that with you. And um, yeah, please go ahead and explore uh, the catalog and let us know if you're if there's anything of interest, and we'll send them to you and you can take a look at them. Um, thanks, Anjali. Uh, so. Uh, right now we have on call with us uh, Sanjana, who has worked primarily on um, making sure that this collection um, is ready for everyone to access and has worked on it at every stage. Uh, so Sanjana, if possible, maybe you could join us and uh, speak to us briefly about how it was working with this collection. Okay. Um, thank you all for joining us for this event. Um, on behalf of the team at the archives at NCBS, um, this event um, really does mark um, a milestone in the journey of a collection. Um, I have not much to add to everything that has been said in this event, and I am um, incredibly grateful for all the work that has gone into making this event accessible, uh, making the collection accessible to the public. Um, all I think that I would kind of like to add to this is just that we undertake this archival labor as um, not just for kind of to make these histories accessible and 
to make these histories visible to the public, but also kind of in an attempt to understand, as Professor Chandrasekhar said, the, the people behind these various processes uh, and these historical events. And I think one of the greatest privileges of working on this collection has been to understand um, Professor Shastri's life um, and to see how people make a difference um, behind all of these large historical events that we only kind of see as events um, on the face of it. Um, that's all I have to add to this so far. Um, I'm really thank you for um, attending this event and I hope you get a chance to visit the archives in person and see some of the material that we have arranged for you. Thank you, Datu. Uh, thank you, Sanjana. Um, so, as Sanjana mentioned, the art catalog is available, and those of you who want to access it um, can do it to our website. Um, so, right now we can open up the floor for question and answers so regarding the collection or just for what we're going to do. I'm tremendously, yes, I'm not looking. Understand all this. It's more than ten years. Mm -hmm. First of all, I want to thank the family of this is the century as well as the century. Just for giving all this things there to our history, and we can in the face of this specific things you see, some children that are and for century for giving context to all these things, and that was very valuable. And the understand the history of how this has developed in the last 30, 30, 30 years or something like that. Um, I also understand some of it because when it was a day, something set up and there is some things in the things. Okay, this is how we have a we have a gene, 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 So it's kind of 
and he's a very, very charismatic, eloquent speaker. I think they had a very they had a very strong network. Yeah. Baba Sarabhai connections. That one knew Sarabhai very well. I think they also had connections to the higher level because NK Jala and Baksa were very close to Indra Gandhi. Sarabhai knew Indra Gandhi directly. Baba knew Indra Gandhi directly. Baba also knew Jawala Gandhi. So they were very privileged in the sense, I don't know whether we would ever be able to do it. So they were able to. And I think it's important to recognize that you need access to the hand of the power if you really want to I think both <laughs> Baba and Sarabhai understood that. So when you look at the difference between traditional scientists and Sarabhai and, and Baba, I think one difference is their ability to connect with the larger political system and power. Because essentially, we want to create. It was also much more exciting time in terms of independence and causes. But it was also a time of great poverty and uh, problems yes. and resources. I think a lot of PRL scientists I know they used to do all. They used to go and buy all kinds of equipment and put things together in order to be able to do it. Okay, and, and I would argue that is innovation that we should study right? because you know we talk about innovation in management school and we have all these great candidates. But it's actually many of those things that, like, unfortunately, we don't have only oral evidence is there. We should do a much more systematic study of what happened in many of them. I, I think it's sort of a lot of stuff in that thing, I think. And we managed to uh, build things that were pretty good and uh, able to do the job. Professor Dawan himself, I know personally, he could uh, do a lot of things. I mean, I came from IIT, but Professor Dawan was far better than me in putting things together. Anything. So my point is, at that time, people were like, I think necessity. Right, was also necessary. Thank you for sharing that with us. So um, with this to come to the conclusion of the uh, event, uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, everyone who spoke, specifically Dinesh Shakti, for um, sharing for this collection in silver, as well as uh, Anjali and Prashant for giving a wonderful overview of the collection, as well as uh, um, giving some context to some of the scientific work that uh, Shastri was engaged in. Um, and uh, thank you to members of the Shastri family for joining. Uh, thank you for Professor Chami Shekhar for also the great, the amazing reflection. Um, on science, uh, space science history in India. And um, also, I would like to extend my um, thank you to uh, TNT Technology as well as NCBS for uh, the support. Um, so, there has been a strong set up outside for all of those who want to just flip through some of the materials in the collection so that you can get a preview of what is inside. And uh, we will also be having a tour of the archive. Um, so, um, yeah, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.